to see those. Are you from Indiana? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I grew up with 40 miles. Listen, you listen for those guys. Make sure they're right when they come in. introduce a, a guest speaker for the EDCI 643 class in agricultural education. Tonight's guest is Harold Taylor. Harold uh, was in charge of the FFA and 4-H program in the state of Indiana from 1946 through 1966. He remained in, in charge of the 4-H program in Indiana until his retirement in 1976. So with that, I will turn this over to Harold, and Harold will share with us some of the history of agricultural education in the state of Indiana. Harold? Thank you. I have some things here that I would like to distribute, not for you to look at now, but for you to have to take home with you. Now these you can't have. These are bulletins, and this might uh, remind you of the one that you were asking about. But I'll lay them out here and we can look at them later. But, um, and these are kind of precious in that, as I've already indicated, there are too many people on this campus that throw things away. And uh, some, some of them are a little scarce. Now another thing that I would like for each of you to take is and here, let me show you. Here is another bulletin type mimeograph that was put out by Z.M. Smith that um, it's on both sides and there are nine pages <coughs> but I had it copied and you have double or single pages. But I thought this one bulletin might give you more condensed information about the background of Z.M. Smith and the program. And so I have brought copies for each of your people to have to keep. And then I have here a couple of books like this that I have pulled together myself as a state supervisor for a law ag education. And this one is a 1963-64. And um, this one here goes back to 1950. I just brought a couple as a sample of the type of materials that I accumulated when I was on the staff. And uh, you can leave through those. Then one further thing. I have here, I thought perhaps <clears throat> my best way to bring you up to date on the historical phase of ag education would be to give you a little background of my, my myself, of my involvement in this program. Now, <clears throat> I hope you won't uh, think that I'm boasting when you see some of these figures. And uh, I hope you won't uh, think in some of the things that I say that uh, are sour grapes, <clears throat> because you must realize that on both of these programs, on each of these programs, I was fired from the job. And uh, you'll understand after I get through what I'm talking about. But I want each of them to have a copy of that that uh, I'll discuss a little bit, and then we'll come back to that. And then, after I give you information on myself as it relates to egg education down through the years, then I want to show you some slides that I've accumulated. And these slides, <coughs> I say they're good slides, they're really not good slides, but they show the picture of egg education as a result of a talk that I gave to the Boeg teachers in 1963 as state supervisor. And at that time, there was agitation to do away 
with this joint effort that ZM started years ago of the VOEG program and the 4 H program being operated by one man. So I think that will be of interest to you. So with that as a sort of a background, I'd like to just start talking about myself, if I may. And if you don't mind, I'll sit down so I'll be at your level. <coughs> And if I start with myself, I hope this won't be boring to uh, you folks, but I'd like to uh, review my background because of the interest that I've had in both programs down through the years. I was born in 1907 in, uh, on a farm east of a little village of Browns Valley, which is about 12 miles south of Crawfordsville in Montgomery County. This was a small farm, an 80-acre farm, which was typical back in those days that my father had bought. And my father got his start in life <coughs> as uh, but he grew up on the farm adjacent to this and uh, made his first money hauling logs uh, from the farms around where people cut for buildings and that sort of thing to the little town of Newmarket where there was a sizable sawmill. And, uh, he made enough money uh, working for the farmers around there to, to buy a team and wagon. And uh, after he'd done that for a while, he made enough money that he could buy another team and he got another wagon. And he hits the wagons and the teams tandem and haul logs in the wintertime and farmed and uh, cut uh, trees in the summertime. Uh, this 80 acres that he bought was about half timber and about half of it too when you bought an old building <clears throat> but they had a house and barn and some other buildings built and that's where they lived and that's where I was born. Uh, this had been bought the year before when my folks were married. <clears throat> so I grew up on this farm and went through the farm life that all the kids go through and and I graduated from the Waveland High School. Waveland is South Crawfordville, about 15 miles. And uh, I graduated there in 1925. Then I came up to Purdue. My mother was quite a, quite a progressive woman, and she thought I ought to go to school. The class I graduated in at Wayland was a small class of about 20 people. And to my knowledge, uh, only one girl went to college and she took a, a nurse's training course and got to be a nurse and died three or four years after she uh, graduated. But uh, everybody else went their different ways, but my mother convinced me that I ought to come up to Purdue, <coughs> which I did moved over here on the University Street and uh, stayed. I really didn't like it and I didn't do very well grade-wise and at uh, Christmas time uh, we had our vacations then and then you had to come back for, to finish the semester. Well, I'd sort of made up my mind that I didn't want any more Purdue. I'd rather farm. I thought I wanted to be a farmer. And uh, but I had the good sense, or somebody did, to go ahead and finish the semester. I came back and finished the semester, and then I went home and uh, uh, lived with my folks, of course, on the farm. Oh, Dad, uh, he got me a job from the local trustee driving a school bus. So I drove a school bus for three years and made enough money to come back to school. But in the meantime, I came up, for some reason or other, my mother still had more influence than I, than anybody that I knew of uh, in that area. She uh, wanted me to come up and take a short course. And I came up, you remember they used to have short courses up here in, in still different do. fields? Yeah. Well, I took a general short course one year, and the next year I came back and took a short course in animal, uh, animal husbandry, we call it, animal science. 
And I guess I kind of like those little short courses in the winter time. And then the next year I came back for another one in props, I think. I forget it. Well, I stayed at home five years. And then I decided I ought to come back to school. When I came out, Vern Freeman was uh, being over here on the Ag side. And I visited with him, and he uh, gave me information and uh, set up a program for me in Ag education because I thought I'd like to be a teacher. And uh, <clears throat> some of these courses that I had taken, and the short courses, I could test out of which I did. And so I started back in the spring where I left off. Started back in the spring of 1931 and I graduated from Purdue in three years because I went three summers straight. That was kind of unheard of back in those days. But I got so I liked school and, and I stayed in the um, Methodist uh, housing unit over here in my later years. But on the campus, and I liked it pretty well. So when I graduated, <coughs> I then uh, tried to get a job, and I was telling the boys here a while ago, I uh, had an interview over at Covington, and the superintendent of schools, my, my uh, future wife was a teacher in the schools down in Putnam County, North Salem, and uh, Rochdale. And so I was going with her uh, as a girlfriend at that time. And when I talked to the superintendent at, uh, uh, in Thompson County at Covington, he said that he seemed to be interested in me. And, and he said, do you have any prospects for getting married? And I said, well, I could. Well, he said, I want a married man, but if you will get married, I'll... Um, I'll uh, put you on the car, and I started over there, and uh, when school started in September of that year. So I always kid my wife about the fact that we had to get married, but uh, people understood at first. Could you share with us how much you made that first year, and when, uh, when that was, what year that was, and how, how hard it was to get a position? Well, that was in 1933, and uh, none of the... I don't know of anybody that got jobs that year in the 33 class. Uh, in, I'm talking about the field of agriculture and, and teaching. You know. But I, uh, they paid me $1,500 at the Covington School. They didn't pay anything, any salary of any kind, until they had a deadline for a fund or something or other. And I went three months without having any pay. I rented a house for, uh, well, I got married with this good-looking girl that I'd been going with, and we rented a house there on the, just next to the square in Covington. It cost us $15 a month for the best rental house in Covington. And uh, it was only about two, about three blocks to walk to the high school. So that was a, uh, it was a delightful experience for me. And then to get married like that and go to school uh, three years in a row and then get married and not have a, we, we were married in, uh, in, uh, in July of 1933. And then for a honeymoon, I, uh, my folks, my parents, my dad and mother took us to the World's Fair in Chicago. That was our honeymoon. We stayed with my parents on our honeymoon. And we all went back. It was a great experience. First time I'd ever been to a big city. Well, <clears throat> after that then, we, uh, well, let's see. Uh, how much more do you want to know about that? I, <laughs> I'll get back. Um, at uh, Covington, of course, I um, taught the regular Volag with the science, and I thoroughly enjoyed the work, enjoyed the science program, and uh, I followed a fellow by the name of Clarence Million, who was one of the top teachers at that time, and he went from there over to uh, Williamsport, 
and uh, I have a picture of him later when he was a, a vocational student. But um, after two years at Covington, I had always been interested in, in ag econ or uh, in that field, and uh, I got acquainted with O.G. Lloyd, who was head of the department that, at that time, and Doc E.C. Young, you may remember that name, he was uh, dean of the graduate school here for years. He was the main person in ag economics at that time, uh, having come from Cornell, and his, his teacher at Cornell was uh, Mr. Warren, who started the field of agricultural economics at Cornell. And Doc Young was a student who came out here for his first job. And he was a great teacher. I, I thoroughly enjoyed being with him. Well, anyway, I uh, came back to see if there'd be any chance that I could get uh, on the, uh, uh, get some money for being a graduate student, you know. And this is a Dr. Lloyd, uh, Prof. Lloyd, we call him, back in those days. And uh, so he said he'd let me know. In the meantime, I looked over at Pine Village at another, thinking I might move to Pine Village uh, in the Boy Field, and uh, they had an opening there, and they were paying $1,800. That was $300 more than I had been getting. I thought that wouldn't be too bad. But I finally decided to come up here on a, on a half uh, scholarship for, for uh, $600. And uh, my wife, um, and I lived over on uh, the next street past University Street and had an apartment up above that, right across from Sammy Cromer. Now, Sammy Cromer was one of the top people in ag education here at that time uh, as a teacher trainer. So, uh, and my wife uh, was a, a good cook, and so she kept and fed and kept five boys while we were doing our graduate work here, and that's when I got my graduate work. I finished all of my graduate work, about my thesis, and uh, had it under Doc Young, and um, Heavy Colmar, you, any of you hear of Heavy Colmar? We got dogs from Heavy. Oh, what do you know? Yeah, he was a great guy. and. Uh, yeah, and in fact, he was my inspiration for uh, going into Ag Econ. But anyway, he got me a job at Michigan State. I went up to Michigan State, was on the staff there for two years doing research in uh, agricultural economics, uh, primarily cost accounting and that sort of thing. And then I went clear blue sky after we'd been there a couple of years, and we thoroughly enjoyed it up there. It was a great place to be. I got this letter from Zan Smith asking me if I would be interested in coming back to Purdue to the teacher training staff. Well, you know, a young guy, even though I was older than uh, most of the fellows graduating, uh, I still you know, liked the idea of coming home. And I got in touch with the and finally decided to come back and be on the staff here and teacher training work. So that's kind of a rundown on, on my life at that time, <clears throat> as I say, I, I uh, came back here and uh, well, I was at Covington from 33 to 35 and then uh, got my master's in 37, 36, uh, yeah, went to uh, Michigan State, was up there two years and came back here in 1938. Well, when I came back here, the well, no, let me let me go back a little bit. When I graduated here, I don't remember too well the uh, teacher training staff, but uh, Sammy Cromer was the main professor in ag education, and I did my practice teaching out at uh, uh, Montmorency, and. Uh, on the teacher training staff here at that time was Dick Gregory, who 
later went to Washington and was on the staff in Washington, and he's dead now. W.A. Smith, whose home was Montmorency, and he had a chance to go to Cornell, and he spent the rest of his life at Cornell, and uh, as far as I know, he's still living. And then K.W. Kiltz. Kiltz, you may, some of you may have heard that name. He was on the staff here at that time as a teacher trainer. And it later became uh, our uh, director of FFA in the state. <clears throat> so that was a teacher training staff that was here at that time. What do you see? Most of those fellows moved on to the brighter lights. And when, <clears throat> when I came here then, uh, after I got back here from Michigan, the um, K.W. Kiltz was on the staff here. And the head uh, of the teacher training staff was a fellow by the name of F.B. Knight. He was, uh, uh, he was in charge of the teacher training work here. G.M. Smith still was uh, uh, in charge of the overall programs, but Knight was the head of the teacher training staff. He came in from Iowa. And he was a great guy. He, he really did a lot of good here. And in fact, he built a house down on Terry Lane, which is next door to where I live now. And uh, I remember him real well. We had him over to our uh, boy conferences from time to time. He was a good speaker. And uh, he was interested in farming. Um, because when he came here out of uh, Iowa, he bought a farm down south of here, not too far from Romney. And Harry Leonard, who was one of the teachers, that, uh, uh, teacher trainers that I followed coming in here, uh, he was a farm manager in Ag Econ. And Doc Knight got Harry Leonard to manage his farm for him. So that kind of tied Doc Knight into the Ag Education program more than anybody else would have been. And <clears throat> so then, uh, since these other fellows had left, Jim Smith had the idea that he wanted on his teacher training staff men who had more interest in, and more knowledge of the actual agricultural field. And so the first man he brought in was a fellow by the name of I.G. Morrison, who came in as a shop man, farm shop, and that sort of thing. He was real good. He came from Illinois. He had a big farm in Illinois that I think belonged to his wife, but uh, he uh, was an Illinois man. And he was on the staff here about two years, I think, before ZM brought in Harry Leonard, who had majored, uh, did his uh, work. Well, he was a teacher, a former teacher, but he had done his graduate work in Ag Econ. And as I say, he was a farm manager. And so he put uh, Harry Leonard on as a teacher trainer. And he officed now, he officed Morrison over in Ag Econ, or Ag uh, Engineering. And he officed Harry Leonard over in Ag Econ because he was uh, in the field of Ag uh, Economics. And when I came in, he put me in the same office with Harry Leonard, both of us. I never did understand why he brought me in, in the field of ag, uh, agricultural economics, since he already had one man. But uh, he brought me in because of my master's, I'm sure, here at Purdue in agricultural economics. So that was the, the way I came into the program here. Now, <coughs> Jim Smith was a very exacting sort of a person. He was, he was a tremendous person, as uh, uh, you really would expect him to be with the things that he did. But uh, he, he was the kind of a person. Let me say one example. Uh, after I was on the teacher training staff here, <coughs> and we had a series of meetings over the state, and uh, Jim was going to those meetings, and I was going to the meetings, but we went in separate cars. And there was a meeting down the southeastern part of the state someplace, I forget where now. 
and uh, there was a mix-up on it some way or other, and we thought that it was to be someplace else. Both ZM and I thought we were going separately. And ZM went to this first place where we thought it was supposed to be, and it wasn't, and they knew that it had been changed to this other place, so ZM drove on over to the other place. And when he got over there, nobody knew that he had been any place else except uh, came directly down to that meeting. Well, when I got over there, I went down to this other place, and uh, uh, they told me where it was, and I went over to the other place. We were both late getting to the meeting, of course, and I apologized for being late. Jim didn't apologize for being late. He didn't tell anybody where he'd been. And that was a good lesson for me. I learned that you don't apologize for things you can't do anything about. And uh, there's no point in making a big issue about uh, some mistake that you've made. You make more than you need to anyway. So that was one of the first lessons I learned from Jim Smith. He, as I say, was a great guy. Well, <clears throat> when I came in here as a teacher trainer, I was assigned the southeastern part of the state. And we had over 400 departments in the state at that time. And uh, to my knowledge, we didn't have any departments that had more than one teacher. But uh, we had a strong program. And... Uh, <clears throat> I had about 120 schools or departments in my southeastern, it was the biggest in the state. But I did what I thought I was supposed to do and check the museum from time to time. And he was, he was real nice about telling me what to do and how to do and what not to do and things of that kind. So I really enjoyed him. So well, your, your, excuse me, your responsibilities or part of your responsibilities as a teacher educator to go out there and follow up the teachers in the field. Yeah. Correct? Mm -hmm. Was there a State Department of Education with supervisors that did anything? At any no, animals? we didn't have any supervisors. Okay. Yeah. No, we didn't have any at that time. And the teacher trainers that we had here uh, were the ones that did what was going on. Of course, CM was a state supervisor. But he didn't have anybody on his staff down at Indianapolis office. He went down there and worked out of that state office. But he didn't have any staff except the teacher trainers here. And, and we had the state divided. Harry Leonard had a section, Morrison had a section, and Kills had a section. Uh, and then when they had specialty problems like farm shops and stuff, and Morrison would go wherever they asked him to, and Kills uh, and got, so he took care of the FFA programs that we had later, and that sort of thing. So, <clears throat> that's, uh, that was pretty much the way it was back at that time. Well, when I came in here, uh, I, of course, first thing I did was try my best to get acquainted with all of the teachers, and that was kind of a job, of course. But in two or three years' time, uh, I was pretty well acquainted, and they made me a secretary of their teachers association, and so they gave me an opportunity to get better acquainted with the teachers. And, and uh, then, uh, ZM retired in 1941. He, uh, he didn't need to, his health was good and that sort of thing, but he thought it was time to retire. He retired in 1941. Well, he had on his 4-H staff here at the university a fellow by the name of Harry Ainsworth, who was a livestock man and a good man. And of course, he worked full-time in the 4-H program. And uh, so he, uh, he moved up. He got uh, Harry to come in to take his place, both places, you see, continue as a 4-H leader and also do the vocational program. That was in 1941. Harry Ainsworth, I worked with him, and uh, he was um, a real nice fellow to work with. 
And uh, so when the veterans training program came along, I had been uh, on the staff here for well, about five years, I guess, as a teacher trainer. And um, or more than that. And uh, Harry Ainsworth and asked me to take leave from the university. I don't know why he asked me, except uh, I was perhaps knew more of the teachers and, and the other teacher trainers, that sort of thing. But he asked me to uh, uh, take leave from the university and start the veterans training program. Now, the veterans training program was a program that they set up for the fellows that came back from the service at that time. So I went down to Annapolis, this was a long, day long in June, I guess. And then uh, I worked on that and covered the whole state, of course, setting up those different programs and getting teachers for them and, and uh, that sort of thing. And you know, I have a bulletin here that, uh, that took care of a lot of it through uh, written materials. And then we stayed, that's another thing I should point this out, I guess, working out of Purdue. Harry Ains, uh, ZM, and Harry Ainsworth, and I in turn, had per dime from here to Indianapolis. We lived here, all three of us lived here. We drove down to Indianapolis and spent sometimes three days, sometimes two days, whatever we felt necessary, on the program out of Indianapolis. And the rest of the time we spent here uh, as uh, supervisors. And, uh, but we got paid our per dime and mileage and that sort of thing through the uh, extension program here. I don't know why it was that way. Now, if we traveled out of Indianapolis to go someplace, we would put that on the vocational program down there in the, in the state house. But our travel back and forth and per dime was given to all of us. To the university here. Well, one evening, oh, I was going to say we stayed at the, uh, when I first went down there, Harry Ainsworth was staying in the old Clay Cool Hotel. It's no longer there in Indianapolis. I later stayed in uh, one of the other hotels, the Harrison Hotel next to the State House there. But uh, we were over in the Clay Cool Hotel, and I had gone down. Uh, I was working there in this veterans training program, and uh, Harry had uh, what he called, a, what we called, a rural youth meeting for the extension service. This is the older youth that, by the name of Mike Reynolds, was in charge of here at Purdue. And Harry had gone to a meeting to be with that group. It was a dinner meeting, and I went back to the office and worked a while, and then I came back to the hotel and uh, uh, went to a movie there in Indianapolis just to kind of kill the evening. And when I came back about 11 o'clock, they, of course, we stayed in the hotel there and all the hotel people knew us, knew who we were. And one of the boys came to me and said, did you know that Harry Ainsworth died out here on the street in front of the hotel? And I said, no. And I, I really couldn't believe it. And I, I went over to the parking lot. We used to always park our cars on the state house parking lot. Back in those days, there was no problem. Now you wouldn't dare do that sort of thing. But uh, I went and got in my car and went out to the city morgue, and sure enough, there it was. And so that was, uh, I didn't know what to do. I'd never been through an experience like that. But the next morning, I went over to the office pulled all of the, you see, Harry Ainsworth, and uh, we all did the same thing, carried a lot of stuff back and forth between the two offices. Harry had a lot of things that I knew belonged to the university. And uh, so I was sitting at my desk, at Harry's desk, we were in the same office there in the state house, on the main floor, on the side next to the town. <coughs> I was sitting there going through Harry's files, pulling out those things that I knew that he belonged to him personally that he should bring back to Purdue and to his house. Well, a fellow by the name of Superintendent of Schools was a man by the name of Malin. 
Dr. Malin, he had been a superintendent of, uh, was a teacher at uh, Terre Haute, what used to be the state teacher's college at Terre Haute. And my wife had had him in class down there. But he was superintendent of schools, and he was kind of an exotic sort of a guy. And he came in when I was sitting there, and uh, he said to me, <coughs> You are now my new state supervisor of ag education. As of this moment. Well, I knew I was in trouble right there. Because that had been a joint appointment from the very beginning, you see. And <coughs> Reed, Harry Reed, was the dean up here at Purdue. And uh, I knew who Harry Reed was. And so. I pulled all that stuff together and put it in a suitcase and brought it up and took part of it. Well, I took some of it to the Harry's widow or wife, and then I took it along to the, uh, his office here to, to Harry Reed to give to him so that he would know what was going on. And I told him what had happened, that uh, Doc Mellon had asked me to take over as the supervisor. Well, I knew by the looks on Dean Reed's face that that wasn't uh, his way of doing things. And so <laughs> I, went, I went ahead and, and um, Harry Reed, Jack Ralston, who was fellow, the best man on the 4-H staff here at the campus, was Jack Ralston, and Harry Reed put him in as head of the 4-H work here. And so we went one year then with uh, Jack working with the 4-H program. And I knew Jack. He lived out here in Montmorency. And uh, so and I spent all my time down at the State House on the vocational program, helping with the veterans uh, program. So that went on for a year. Then we had a new superintendent come in by the name of Watt. He was a big army man. And when they set up the plans to replace or to correct this uh, job that Z.M. Smith had had and Harry Ainsworth had had, why well, Dean Reed uh, had a list of people that he wanted to put in that he would like to see in. And uh, I wasn't on the list, I don't think, in the beginning uh, for uh, various reasons. But uh, he finally put me on the list, and uh, there were there was one of the 4-H uh, men on the list, and another and two other fellows that uh, the dean thought ought to be on the list. And so this army man, who was state superintendent, because he knew who I was and knew the circumstances, and. And so he came up and visited with Dean Reed, and uh, the dean pulled these names out and said, now this is the man I want you to put on, on uh, in the place of Harry Ainsworth. And uh, Colonel Watts said, no, he said, I don't want to operate that way. He said, this is a joint uh, project. And he said, I tell you, if you're agreeable, if you'll make up a list of the people you would like to have, then my part of the bargain will be to select one of those men, and I'll select from your list. Well, as I say, fortunately, I had been put on the list, and of course, I was already on the job down there. And the colonel put, put me in. It's the only way I got in. So that was a lucky deal for me. But uh, everything worked out all right. And <clears throat> then I came up here and I used this Jack Ralston. He really was uh, the best man on the 4-H staff and should have had the job that I had. But uh, he was an older man and uh, I was just lucky you know, to get the job because I was especially interested in both I was interested in both fields. I'd never been in 4-H, 
never been an FFA because it wasn't available when I was a kid down in school. But uh, I've been associated with a lot of people and have been. So, Harold, in, in, in summation here, it wasn't ZM Smith that changed the joint position of 4-H FFA or 4-H in Ag Education. It was the dying of the person yeah. that's in Oh, yeah. oh yeah, ZM never would have uh, never would have changed twenty times. So actually, then Dean uh, Reed was the the dean responsible at that time, yeah. along with Superintendent Watt, that mm -hmm. said there will be a splitting. There will be a person for 4-H, and there there will be a person that's ag education, mm -hmm. and one person. Yeah. Uh, now, if the dean had had his way. He still would have gone along with it, but he would have uh, uh, put this. You see, uh, what they were, uh, Dean Reed and Colonel Watt were centering on one person to do both jobs. Had uh, the, the dean put in the man that he wanted, then I would have been out down at the state house, you see, and uh, out up here also. And the new man that he would have appointed would have uh, taken both jobs. That's, that's what the dean wanted. He didn't, he didn't want to do away with that relationship. He just wanted somebody else besides me to handle it, you see. Okay. So, but that's... Um, so the position, really, you went back to a position that was held jointly by, was held by one person for both 4-H and FFA. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Harry Ainsworth, you see. Had that job for five years after uh, ZM, right. and ZM uh, was the one that started it. And then I took it over. I, I skipped one year. Uh, I was state supervisor of ag education full time after I started, but I they didn't put me on the 4-H staff until the following year. So that's that's the way that turned out. Well, it's not taking a while. Okay. Well, I, I made these notes here so that I could uh, not mess too much that I wanted to talk about. That kind of brings me up to date, I think. And uh, if we could set up to show some of those. Now, wait a minute. Let's see what time we got. Yeah, it's 10 minutes to 7. Uh, let's get them on. Do we have time to see those slides? Sure, yeah. yeah. Well, no, wait a minute. Let me, let me see. You call it. <coughs> well, I'll uh, kind of hurry through some of this stuff. Now, some of this, now, let me point out before I start that I have here a set of slides and a script that I use to talk to the VOAG teachers at their state conference here at Purdue. I always held it here at Purdue over in the Union Building. And I talked to those fellows in 1963. Now the, the uh, main thrust of my discussion to them was the fact that they were uh, going to separate the two programs. And uh, that was the thing that I was trying to hold to, that uh, uh, I was talking to the teachers about. And, and this started uh, uh, from the teachers, and uh, I'll, I'll discuss that a little bit after we see some of these pictures. Now, these pictures won't be too good, but they are old, and that may be the reason. Do you want to, you want me to handle moving them along? Talk about it? I uh, see. Now let me do that. There you go. And uh, you fix the light so I can see. No, he's got to have this light on down here. Alright, we'll see how the Now keep in mind, all of you, that this, uh, and my script here, and I haven't changed it too much, I've cut out a lot of it, 
but it has to do with talking to this group of teachers. And we had large numbers in those days, and they were over in the ballroom in the union building. And this is a style of presentation that uh, would have been given back in those years. And I say, <clears throat> and the title of my talk was, What's Past is Prologue. What's Past is Prologue. And as I've indicated on my paper here, this is presented to the boy teachers in their annual conference on July 9th, 1963. Now here's, this is typical of the way we started uh, in talks that we gave. Woodrow Wilson, our 20th president, was inaugurated. The Woolworth Building, the tallest building in the world, was built. Eleanor Porter, uh, uh, Eleanor Porter wrote Pollyanna. Henry Ford set up his first assembly line, raised wages to $5 a day, and the Model T Ford dropped in price to $290. For you baseball fans, Walter Johnson pitched 56 consecutive innings, allowing no runs. This was the year of the big flood, talking about the flood here in Lafayette, and both bridges across the Wabash went out. One year later, World War I broke out in Europe, and the Smith-Lever Act was passed by Congress establishing the Federal Extension Service. This was a year on February 22, 1913, that the Indiana State Legislature passed the Indiana Vocational Education Law. The legislature saw fit at that time to include in the law this statement regarding appointments. The state superintendent, with the approval of the State Board of Education, is authorized to cooperate with Purdue University in the appointment of some person actively connected with the Agricultural Extension Service of Purdue as an agent in supervising agricultural education, who shall serve in a dual capacity as an agent of the state superintendent and an assistant at Purdue University. This person shall be subject to removal for a cause by the State Board of Education. In preparation for this discussion with you, you fellas, I noted that I noted with much interest that our local newspaper carried this statement on June 30 in a column entitled "50 Years Ago." That's what you're looking at now. And then <clears throat> the state organization for the new vocational education work in Indiana was completed this week when President. Stone of Purdue announced the selection of Professor Z.M. Smith of Purdue as agent in charge of agricultural education. Smith will have nothing to do with the appointment of county agents as provided in the vocational education law. This falls directly on President Stone and Professor Christie. And of course, <laughs> The man referred to in this article is the person who established the Indiana Vocational Program 50 years ago. Now this is Z.M. Smith, the greatest man that I ever knew, ever had the privilege to work with, and uh, many people can say that. He was, he was a grand person. Dr. Smith was a schoolman. He grew up in Tipton County, graduated from DePaul University, Purdue University and Indiana University was principal of high school in Danville, Illinois for four years prior to becoming principal of Jefferson Township Schools in Goldsmith, Indiana. And in 1912 was appointed Indiana State Forest Club leader. Note that, 1912. He agreed to accept the position as state supervisor of agricultural education in 1913 on the condition that he continue to serve as state forest club leader. His stated philosophy at that time was, and this is in some of the material that I have given to you to take home with you. Agriculture one, agricultural education, education and vocational education and agriculture in a community or in a county are concerned with identical human resources, the same families including children, youths and adults identical natural resources, farms and their crops, livestock and equipment. Number two, sound agricultural education is based upon human and natural resources, 
the needs, interests, and welfare of families and individuals and the means or resources available or to be made available for meeting these needs. Number three, vocational and extension agents in agricultural education may and should assist in determining the program to be followed in a given community or county. Certainly they must supply educational leadership in carrying out effective instruction as an integral phase or unit of the program. Number four, the program is to be the program to be sufficient must meet with the educational needs of children, youth, and adults. Furthermore, there is no stage in the life of an individual in which the educational process should terminate. Therefore, the application of the draw of the program for agricultural education continues throughout the life of an individual. That's that's quite a statement, I think, and coming from a person who had never been involved in this sort of thing before, except as a teacher in the school, man, was really something. The teaching of agriculture in our public schools in Indiana was not new at this time. As early as 1860, the State Department of Public Instruction had recommended the teaching of agriculture, and one of you fellows made mention of that a while ago. In 1911, agriculture was being taught in over 3,000 elementary schools and 366 high schools in Indiana. Most of these, most of this, of course, was textbook teaching. As a school principal, now this is E.M. Smith talking, you see. As a school principal and teacher, Dr. Smith used different methods from most teachers and developed the procedures that emphasized class discussion, school laboratory exercises, and individual pupil project performances and demonstrations on the home farm on a 12-month basis. I get that. I presume that this was the reason that he was noted as an outstanding leader and brought to the position that made him Indiana's pioneer in agricultural education. Now, keep in mind I'm talking to this group of teachers. Now, for 50 years we have operated under this broad educational program. If some of you have your way, we are now listening to the last official address that will be given by a state supervisor who also has the opportunity to serve as state director of the University Extension Youth Program. It is this broad educational opportunity that I am fighting for, the opportunity to coordinate the total youth programs in the state for our rural people. This is the position and the opportunity that will be gone forever if we allow it to be dropped now. The loss will not be replaced with a full-time state supervisor. I am highly complimented that most of you as teachers have asked me to serve as full-time supervisor. This in itself is an indication of satisfaction with me as a leader and with the program as it had developed under my guidance. I am more highly complimented by this chart that shows tremendous progress and development in our program, particularly during the past 15 years. Note the big expansion of the Young Farmer Program as well as the Adult, the adult Farmer and FFA. I might point out, uh, well that clear up a little bit, I might point out that <clears throat> when I came on in this new position, I felt the need to do something about FFA. We had a very, uh, very weak FFA program in our ag education, and we had a strong 4-H program. And I felt that we had a need to do something about the FFA, and that's the reason that uh, you see quite a tremendous increase in FFA on that chart in the uh, few years to follow. I say here I'm even... A, no, I said that in the adult department. Strange as it may seem, this start is the same information that was presented to the State Board as evidence to support the petition to separate the two probes. Now, the thing that happened 
they were in the process, we had a, super, a different superintendent at this time, Ben Watt had left, and we had a fellow by the name of Wilson. We called him, he was a big tall fellow, about six and a half feet tall, and we called him Wee Willie. And uh, he was a good school man, but he was more of a politician than he was a school man. And so he was holding uh, the, some of these teachers that wanted to see the change made, and some of the people up here at Purdue were he was holding meetings to discuss this, and that's the reason I was uh, making the statement. And J.R. Mitchell, by the way, who was on the staff, teacher training staff here at one time, and died just here a while back, uh, was one of the top people that uh, was supportive of this joint effort that we had had all these years. I was pleased with J.R. Mitchell's statement in this meeting that this evidence is sufficient in itself to indicate that the present program is a highly successful one and should be continued. Perhaps we've been too far out front in a program of this kind, but it seems to me that other states are beginning to see some of the possibilities and opportunities in a program such as ours. For a number of years, Wisconsin has used the same teacher training staff to train both FOIA teachers and county extension agents. Ohio initiated this type of program just a short time ago, and Howard Addison, one of our top teachers, who will finish his PhD this summer, has been employed by the Maryland staff, which is being developed specifically to train both ag teachers and county extension agents. Regardless of the final decision, I want all of you to know that I am extremely grateful for the opportunity that has been mine to serve as coordinator of these tremendously important educational programs for our Indiana rural population. My dedication in life has been to serve farm people. I wholeheartedly believe this is the most efficient and the most effective way. I am proud of the work that has been done. I am proud of the support that most of you, and by far the majority, have given to me as your state supervisor. I do this controversy I do hope this controversy will be settled soon. It is definitely hurting our program. You fellows cannot afford to split yourselves wide open over such an issue. There are so many more important things to be done. <clears throat> if we as professional people are to serve to our greatest capacity, we must, each of us, dedicate ourselves to a unifying program. <clears throat> Your conference program planning committee asked me to review for you the 50 years of history of education and agriculture in Indiana. <clears throat> That's one of the things that we did as a supervisor. I always gave a talk to the teachers each year, but I usually ask them what they would like for me to talk about. Ours <clears throat> is an outstanding record, and of course I can only call attention to some of the highlights done through the years. Many of you will be interested in such a review because you've had a major part in helping to develop our heritage. The rest of you will be interested because it is this background that will enable you to build even greater heights in the years to come. <coughs> uh, this is kind of a cut and dry type thing. And I call <coughs> these the war years, the first 10 years. This was the era of the First World War involving us beginning in 1917 with the armistice in 1918, and this in turn followed the Victory Gardens and all that had to do with the war. This picture was taken in 1913 and gives emphasis, emphasis to the fact that there was close cooperation between the county extension agent and the county superintendent of schools. You can't tell who those are, but one's a superintendent of schools and the other's an agent. <coughs> Again, as Dr. Smith pointed out, their common interest being a farm boy and his development. Let me point out now that these pictures, for the most part, are uh, pictures that have been taken that I accumulated down through the years for other reasons. I don't know why. I just saved them. And uh, uh, they, at one time, were better than they are now, but they're all black and white pictures, of course, and taken by some amateurs, I don't know who they were.
This picture was taken in 1916 and sent to the Washington office by John Linky. Linky was a native of Indiana. Mr. Linky became commissioner of education in, Washington, in the Washington office and had tremendous influence on the development of agriculture agricultural education in the nation as a whole. In 1915, we had the first convention of the American Vocational Association meeting in the LaSalle Hotel in Chicago. Dr. Z.M. Smith was to play a very important part in the AVA in later years. There were seven departments of vocational agriculture in Indiana in operation in 1914 and the seven are Arcadia, Fairmount, Indianapolis, Pendleton, uh, Star City, Union Township, and Johnson County, and uh, Westfield. <clears throat> this, pic this picture was taken, if I get these mixed up, you'll have to correct me. This picture was taken from the cover of a bulletin. That's one of these bulletins I think I have here. Uh, the State uh, Board of Education and indicates the boy is one of 65 who did home project work under the direction of E.C. Stair <coughs> and A.C. Hoffman at Technical High School in Indianapolis. Mr. Hoffman gave a lifetime to vocational education in the Indianapolis schools and E.C. Stair, and I had him in class here in horticulture and other students, was most had made most of his contribution as a member of the Purdue University Horticultural Staff. This picture was taken out of another State Board of Education publication and shows Terrence William, a farmer boy teacher with a guilt he called Lady Prospect that was a junior champion at the State Fair in 1917, 1919. The guilt later sold for $675. <clears throat> now, I think I've already indicated that I followed this man as a vocal ag teacher at Covington. He went over to uh, Williamsport and then eventually got in the seed business and got to be quite well to do. <clears throat> I say that not to get you away from education, but uh, the education doesn't pay as well as some other occupations. <clears throat> the Smith Hughes Act was passed in 1917, and since there were only 14 states with a vocational education program prior to this set, in this act, Indiana had much to do with the development of the Smith Hughes Act, particularly through Dr. Smith. However, uh, doc, he is not the person named in the Smith Hughes Act. You see, Dr. Smith was not that one person. Now, here's another uh, similar picture. <clears throat> Uh, uh, here, note the title of this bulletin was printed in 1922, put out by the Department of Public Instruction, Division of Vocational Education, Department of Agricultural Extension of Purdue University, Federal Board for Vocational, and U.S. Department of Agriculture Cooperating. And the title of the bulletin, Club of Vocational Training and Farming and Homemaking in Fountain County. This boy is Ed Mallett who had graduated from high school in vocational agriculture and had six years of 4 club work. And this cow was the foundation animal for developing a purebred Guernsey herd for him and his family. Can any of you remember the tremendous size of the draft horses that were developed in this era? The man standing at the rear of the horse is Professor Gobble, and this was taken in 1918. That's over in the old pavilion that some of you may have been in, but uh, uh, we used it all the time for livestock judging, of course. Was that a livestock judging contest? Pardon? Was that last, go back to that last slide, was that a livestock judging contest? That uh, probably was a training program. For, uh, uh, put on by the animal husbandry staff for students that we had here. But they were all wearing suits? Hmm? They were all wearing suits? Was that the gross requirement at that time? No, no, we never had anything like that. That, that may be something else. I don't know. You can't tell really who they are. Special event, anyway. Yeah, yeah. 
So I don't, I really don't know, but I know that that's a touch of knowledge. Back. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Some of these old pictures are real good. I said that a while ago, and you're not thinking they're very good, but uh, I'm real glad to have them. Unfortunately, many of them do not carry full information and oftentimes not the dates. This is Otis Crane. He's the guy on the right there up in the corner uh, with his Voag staff at Marion. And Otis Crane was one of the outstanding philosophical. Every once in a while you run into a teacher that is a good philosopher. You've had some of them. And usually they are the best teachers you ever have. But Otis Crane was a real philosophical sort of a teacher, and he gave so much to the development of vocational education in its early years. <clears throat> this is a real special picture, but particularly if you note the distinguished young man on the left there, with, uh, sitting down uh, with a uh, watch chain across his chest and vest on the left side there. It's L.C. McIntosh. But his boy, remember now, I'm talking to these ag teachers. Elsie uh, McIntosh, and most of them knew him, with his boy class of boys at Forest, Indiana. Here again, all of us will associate Elsie McIntosh with the list of top pioneer teachers who developed the framework for the vocational program in Indiana, and the, that has made it outstanding. It so was during this 10-year period. <coughs> that the Boy Scout organization was started in 16, the 18th Amendment prohibiting liquor traffic was ratified in 19, Warren Harding was made president in 20, and the de decade closed with 63 departments of vocational agriculture in Indiana in 1923, and those that many of us know included in this group are, some of the name of Bundy that I know, K.W. Kiltz is in there, for, uh, later uh, in charge of our FFA program. This L.C. McIntosh is in there. Uh, on Riley Case, one of our good county agents is in there. And the W.A. Smith was on, that was on the teaching, teacher training staff uh, that went to Cornell is on there. Now the second 10 years. Now we come to the second ten-year period of vocational education in Indiana, and I choose to call this the post-war years, running from 1923 to 33. To set the stage for this significant era of history, you will recall that President Harding died, Calvin Coolidge was inaugurated, Lindbergh uh, made his non-stop flight to Paris, and Amelia Earhart was the first woman to fly to the Atlantic. You see last night on TV where they think they know for sure that uh, where they landed. Uh, Herbert Hoover, and we all got to know her, of course, when she was on the staff here at Purdue. Herbert Hoover was made president in 28, Franklin D. Roosevelt in 32, and Charles Lindbergh's boy was kidnapped that same year, and of course the outstanding event of the 10-year period was the stock market crash in 1929. Well, that's, that's the way we gave speeches back in those days. In this decade of emphasis, a lot of emphasis was given to judging work as a part of our educational program. At this time, they call our judging contest Junior Judging Contest. I don't know where that name came from, but that's what they call all the contests. They involved all of the 4-H boys and girls that wanted to participate, and all of the vocational boys, as well as other youth of this age group that wanted to take part in the program. <coughs> At that time, we also had an intermediate state judging contest <coughs> at Purdue University before we had the finals at the state fair. This is one of uh, Don Allen's pictures in the old livestock judging pavilion. <coughs> Our prison uh, crops judging contest was known in 1926 as corn judging and was held in the office and classrooms of Professor Robbins. Now this was in Ag Hall, what I call Ag Hall, the old administration building over here that they want to tear down. Uh, he was over there <coughs> in that building in agronomy upstairs, and that's where they had uh, uh, this contest. Uh, there were 48 teams <coughs> of three boys, 
each participating in the contest this year, and the Knightstown team, coached by Harry Ainsworth, I told you he was a good judge, was the winner. He was coach of the school, uh, the team. <coughs> This is a photograph of the winning team in poultry and egg judging at Purdue in 1926. This team is the Delaware County team, winners at the Indiana State Fair in 1929 and represented Indiana in an international livestock judge, judging contest in Chicago. The boy on the right is Lawrence Love, a big farmer near Eaton, Indiana, and he was also one of our boy teachers at one time. I thought you'd be interested in this picture showing the boy class at Summer, Summitville as they were preparing to participate in a parade as a part of the community affair in that vicinity. Note the wording of some of the signs. The big sign indicating vocational, identifying the group, plus the smaller signs of electricity, forever home, 78 club members, farming and business. We represent our communities. Let's modernize. In 1927, farm mechanics was very much a part of our program, as indicated by this photograph showing J. O. James, a teacher of Bloomington, Indiana, with one of his vocational classes in farm mechanics. The outside door of the shop appears to be rather small, but even so, it seems to me there must have been a tremendous amount of work done in this farm mechanic shop in the Bloomington School. Vocational classes in this era had fun and the same, the same they do today. And this is a photograph of A.T. Marble. A.T. Marble was one of the outstanding teachers that we had, an older teacher. When he was teaching at Pendleton with a group of boys that he had at the Indiana State Fair. I'm sure our teachers and agents had just as much fun enjoying the work relations, working relationship with their boys and girls that they had in 4-H and were as filled with satisfaction as results of this in 1928 at the State Fair Boys Camp as they are today, but it is obvious the facilities are somewhat different than they were at that time. Most of you know Merritt Thornburg. I'm talking to the teachers now again. In Decatur County, and this shows shows him with a, a first prize shorthorn senior heifer, a uh, senior calf and champion shorthorn winner at the Indiana State Fair. And the award was a trip to, to the international given by the State Board of Agriculture. He was one of our long time teachers. I prize this photograph highly for the reason that it is, it is labeled Pendleton Alumni Farmers. This is an organization of young men who have studied agriculture in the Pendleton High School and are now living on farms trying to put into practice the things they learn in school. This is our young farmer program. For many years, one highlight of the annual conference for the boy teachers was a group picture that was taken. It is unfortunate that this practice has been discontinued. <coughs> Or as we get older, pictures of this kind carry a lot of meaning and fond remembrances of associations with fellow teachers in the chosen field. I've had a lot of those pictures, <coughs> but they haven't done that for a long time. Let me go back uh, and bring out some of the highlights of this 10-year period. Z.M. Smith was the first director of vocational education from 23 to 36. I get that. This is the director of vocational education, not, not supervisor, but the director down at the State House. The history of the position of the vocational director in Indiana has been an interesting one, and I suppose for the most part it has, has resided with the state superintendent of schools more than it has with a special person under him. It was during this period from 23 to 31 that Z.M. Smith was the executive secretary of the American Vocational Association. Jim started <clears throat> the quarterly news bulletin of ABA and served as its editor from 1925 to 29. Those of you who are involved in the National 4-H uh, uh, Teachers Association have 
close contacts with the American Vocational Association will find from time to time reference to the outstanding work that was done by Z.M. Smith in helping to organize and develop the American Vocational Association in the early days. Dr. Smith also originated the Agricultural Ag, Ag, Ag Education Magazine. Someplace in my files I have copies of that and I couldn't find them any place. In 1927, he was the managing editor for a two-year period. It was in 1924 that the Indiana Vocational Agriculture Teachers Association was organized. This is an association of the teachers. The Constitution lists as its objectives to promote the teaching of agriculture, to devise ways and means for increasing the efficiency of such instruction in elementary and secondary schools in Indiana, and to cooperate with other agencies for the advancement of agricultural education. The annual dues was one dollar per person. The Ten-Year Club was organized in 1931. It's a group of special teachers that, that uh, had more tenure than others. Honorary members of the club were Dick Gregory, the one that went to Washington, W.A. Smith, the one that went to Cornell, and Z.M. Smith. The Ten-Year Club was quite active for many years and rendered a real service to the boy teachers in Indiana. The State Corn the Husking Contest Program was uh, organized in 1931. Uh, I think I'm lost. Uh, no, uh, State Corn Husking Con Program was organized in 1931. Uh, one of the major highlights of this post era was the establishment of the National FFA uh, Program at a meeting in the Baltimore Hotel in Kansas City in 1926. Some of you may have read about that in history. Indiana was the 19th state to organize FFA. And uh, we're back. I'm ahead of myself with one. I chose to call the third decade, that's what we're talking about, the year of the Great Depression, 1933 to 43. This was the era of the bank holidays, the alphabet governmental agency, John Dellinger was shot, Social Security was passed, the German forces invaded Czechoslovakia and Poland in 1939, Wendell Wilkie was defeated in 40, and how well you remember uh, Pearl Harbor in 41. The Hoosier Lamb Show, one of the outstanding educational programs that came into the picture in this decade, decade and then gradually faded away was the Hoosier Market Land Show. This was held at Indianapolis in conjunction with the Stockyards, sponsored heavily by the Producers Marketing Association, and did much to promote sheep and lambs in Indiana. And I made a bad statement there, even though it probably was contrary to good management practices, that was the farm management coming out of it. It was in connection with the Hoosier Market Lamb Show that we had one of our uh, outstanding experiments in an awards program. Now, this will shock you. There was a, much agitation at that time to adopt the Danish system of awards. And those of you who have, who have worked with the livestock people know how difficult this can be. In a state committee meeting, a compromise rule was worked out however, in which the decision was made to allow a reasonable price for the top lamb that was sold to go to the owner of the lamb and the balance of the money to be distributed to the rest of the Blue Ribbon winners in the lamb show. We survived the one, that one year, but went back to the old system after that. Now, the, you know what I'm talking about. They wanted to take all the money and redistribute it on an equal basis to everybody that participated. That's the socialistic way, I guess, that we had a taste of at that time. Well, here's a group of men that were responsible for this lamb show. These are the four men representing various agencies that made the Hoosier Lamb Show possible. Charlie Raw was president of the Union Stockyards, and I get the positions that these fellows held and President 
of the Gulf Railway Company, Jack Oldham, Oldham was Secretary Treasurer of the Indianapolis Livestock Exchange. Scott Meese, that I knew personally, was manager of the Indianapolis Producers Commission, and Doc Farrington was president of the National Livestock Exchange. Those of you who had the opportunity to work with these men know the satisfaction that comes in our work with persons from outside agencies and using them to help develop an educational program for our rural people. This is another phase of vocational of the vocational program that some uh, that came and went. This is an announcement of a district contest involving Bartholomew Decatur Johnson Shelby County of Morristown in 1928. And note that Nelson Parkhurst, you heard of him, who was on here at Purdue for years, now registrar at Purdue University, as chairman and Dick Harlow, one of our local teachers out here on, on the county school board, was chairman. Then we had a state corn husking contest that year held at Williamsport. Frank Smitty was president of the organization. This was quite an event involving a band, a parade, following a contest. There was a banquet for the Williamsport High School in the at the Williamsport High School Gymnasium, and the speaker for the evening was D.C. Freeman, Dean of Agriculture at Purdue University. In 1941, the year of Pearl Harbor, Irvin Shank, an Indiana FFA boy, was national president of Future Farmers. Z.M. Smith retired in 1941 and was replaced by Harry Angler. At the close of this period, we had over 400 departments. Now, the fourth period, this period, 40, and 1943 to 53, I shall call the war, more war years. D-Day was uh, June 6, 44, Mark, uh, some of these are marked out. This was the year President Roosevelt died. Harry Truman became president. The Marshall Plan was inaugurated. Uh, we went into Korea. President Eisenhower was elected in 1952. Now, this is the man you've been waiting to see, Harry Ainsworth. He served as your state coordinator of youth programs from 1941 to 1946. He was a native of Decatur County, did his undergraduate work at the University of Illinois, his master's at Purdue, and taught Boag at Mount Summit and Knightstown. Professor Ainsworth was quite an outstanding livestock man and had much to do, to do with the tremendous development of judging and uh, contest in Indiana. This is one of the outstanding boys in the Boag in this area. Most of you recognize him as Damon Catron, a former Boag teacher, member of the State Forest Club staff, going from there to Walsham, Carolina, and on to Iowa State College to receive his PhD, and he was one of the world's authorities on hogs in later life. It was in June 1946 that I was asked to, uh, I've talked some about this, but I'll go ahead and read this. I was asked by the state supervisor to take leave of absence from Purdue and go to the state house to initiate the training program. Uh, uh, let me skip on down here. We, we closed this, this period that I'm talking about here in 1953 with 368 departments. Now, uh, keep in mind we were getting some departments at that time that had two teachers. <clears throat> well, here's the fifth. I suppose you would call this the decade of the Cold War era. This period is 53 to 63. In 1964, we had the hydrogen bomb. Uh, in 1970, 57, the Soviet Union launched the first Earth satellite. Uh, we had uh, Little Rock, and Billy Graham, and, and, uh, world record speed by a jet airplane, 1,400 miles an hour, and two new states. <clears throat> this perhaps, oh, I want to go back to that. This perhaps is the most important thing that happened to me during this decade, or during my lifetime for that matter. 
1953, you as teachers honored me with life membership in the American Vocational Association, and I cherish this more than any recognition that has ever been given to me. Life membership in the association is very limited. I'm proud to display this framed certificate in my office so that all the world may see the honor and respect that has been paid to me by my fellow teachers. I'm sure that most of you will agree that the land or soil judging contest program is our most outstanding educational contest or activity. This picture was taken at Sullivan in 1958. The program was initiated in 53 and the first land judging contest held as an invitational event in Wayne County. By the way, I took that picture myself. See how much better my pictures are than these of this? <clears throat> but that was kind of eight years. Rod McKinney came to the state office as assistant supervisor. And many of you perhaps did not realize that prior to his coming, practically all of the supervisory work was done by the teacher training staff here at the university. We were talking about that a while ago, as not having any supervisors at the state office. And this is done primarily because of the veterans training program that they got into. These, these fellows, Rod, and uh, this next one is Carl Scott. The second major event of the current period was the addition of Carl Scott to our state staff. Much of the credit for the progress that we made in this term, current decade goes to Rod and Carl for the outstanding work that they have shown and, de and demonstrated both with you teachers and with school administrators throughout the state. This picture of Carl was taken in 1960 uh, with the airport in Kansas City in the background. <clears throat> the first national 4-H conference for state FFA officers was held in Washington, D.C. in 1959. These are the boys from Indiana. At this conference was President Eisenhower. I took this as he was greeting the boys, I was fortunate to be close enough so that you know, I got a real good picture of President Eisenhower as our national president. Are you wanting to take a break or something here, or is it time for us all to go home? Or? No, not yet. Why don't you show You have one more slide, don't you? Yeah, but I, I uh, Well, yeah. Go ahead. Let me, let me show you. <clears throat> I know of no way of judging the future but by the past. I knew, I see the boys asked me to talk about the past. I knew the minute the boys asked me to talk about the past that I wanted to use the title of the past as prologue for my speech. You'll find this inscription under one of the figures in the National Archives buildings in Washington. It's interesting to note that the slide that you are now viewing is a copy of the calendar that was hanging in my kitchen at home for the month of June. I know of no way of judging the future but by the past. I thought that was an interesting coincidence. All of this is to say that the past is but the beginning of the future, and even though my allotted time today has been primarily a review of the past, I want to look with you briefly into the future, and for this, and for this is really where our interests lie. Allow me to make some predictions or express some of my beliefs concerning the future. Well, that's a different story, and you may not want to go into that. We wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't mind hearing some of the predictions that <laughs> you had. Well, I, I, I have three double-spaced uh, uh, okay. pages here. You want me to read those? Uh, if you could share with us verbatim instead of there, that'd be fine, or you can read them, whichever you prefer. Well, uh, no, I get into a uh, little philosophy here. And <clears throat> do any of you folks need to leave, or do you wish to leave? Uh, I can, these predictions have to do with the field of agriculture. Carol, only read the ones that occurred. <laughs> As I look these over after these uh, years, most of them have. But uh, let, let me talk about something else, just a minute. Because uh, I think that my time is... Uh, I want to go back to this split in this deal. 
to see if I can uh, give some 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 re or to give you some reasons for uh, the uh, program breaking up like it did. In the first place, as I indicated, we had a large number of departments when I came back here to teach a training. And we were short of teachers because of that. We had more teachers than we knew. Uh, we had more departments than we knew what to do with it. And so we began to get teachers in from other states. Now, none of the states, no state has ever had this joint program that we had. Uh, that we had. <clears throat> and so most of the teachers that came in were teachers from Kentucky and Wisconsin. There was a teacher training school in Wisconsin, and in Kentucky they had uh, uh, small colleges that, that trained teachers. Well, ZM discovered after he began to let some of these fellows in that they didn't have the training at all that our teachers had here, and so he required those teachers to uh, uh, take extra courses after they came in. He, he didn't stop them or didn't send them home, but he insisted that they take special courses to better qualify themselves for working here. But those teachers had never had anything to do with 4-H work, you see. <clears throat> so they were, I mean, had never, yeah, had never had anything to do with 4-H work. Then <clears throat> we expanded our, our FFA program. Now this maybe was a mistake on my part but I'm not sorry for it, and I still feel that we needed to do what we, uh, what I thought we had to do to make FFA as prominent as uh, 4-H had been, or was. Then we had opposition from the teacher training staff. The teacher training staff here, uh, uh, I don't want to talk out of turn, and most of these people you won't know, I guess, but uh, uh, this uh, Dr. Knight, who was here as a head teacher trainer, was a real, I thought, a real fabulous person and did a lot for our educational program. Then we had a fellow come in by the name of B.C. Lawson. Have you heard that name or seen it print? He was the head teacher trainer here. And he didn't... Uh, he wasn't interested in the uh, in the uh, ag program at all. He didn't have any background in farming. He wasn't interested in farming. Really, I don't know why he was in the position he was in, but he didn't seem to be interested in the field of agriculture. But he was interested in at his training and teaching, of course. He was chairman, and he opposed uh, the uh, teachers working with the 4-H uh, boys. See, uh, we justified the program to the, everybody that raised a question about it, as the M. Smith had, by the fact that our boy teachers used the 4-H program as a way of getting boys in, uh, boys, well, you excuse me, we didn't have any girls in boy at that time, getting boys into the boy program, you see. And so the teachers were glad to have a chance to get acquainted with the families and the boys and girls in their neighborhood so that eventually they would come into their uh, vocational program. And um, the county agents were glad to have the boy teachers do this sort of thing because that strengthened their 4-H program. So it was a joint effort with uh, GM Smith and I and some of the rest of them. So it was a perfect program. Harold, when you were saying that Knight was the head teacher educator, was that teacher ed head teacher educator for elementary and all secondary, or is he? No, he was school head of the school of education. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, he was a top man. So then, uh, Z M Smith, uh, as a head teacher educator, was he actually head of quote the school or department of education? No, he, he was, never had that. He, was he, just he never had education. that. He was state supervisor of ag education. Right. He was state forage club leader, but he never was uh, uh, the head teacher trainer. So the head the head Why teacher not? trainer is what we would consider now the dean of school of education. Well, you guys are uh, 
were the head teacher at the yeah, camps. Okay, I was just trying to get a picture of this night person yeah. uh, as to whether he was he was head teacher trainer for ag education. No, he was head of the education department. Department. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I have perhaps have misquoted myself, but I he was it. he was over the uh, education department. But he was always so cooperative with with all of us and uh, came over and talked to our teachers. And he was interested. And he was interested in the agricultural end of it because he bought those farms over here that he had. But he couldn't see the 4-H connection. No, he, wa he wasn't uh, against it. No, no. This man Lawson was the one that... Lawson. I'm sorry. Lawson was the head teacher trainer. So when Knight stepped down, Lawson took over, and that's where some... I suppose, I don't remember this too well, but he must have taken over, and Knight died. And uh, then uh, Lawson came in as what we call the head teacher training. And then he was followed by Ed Clannon, wasn't he? Lawson, I'm pretty sure he was. You know Clannon, don't yes. you? Yes. Yeah. Now, well, they brought some others in to the teacher training staff. Now, I hope I'm not being hypocritical here, but uh, this is the way I saw those fellows. A fellow by the name of Bentley came in. He, his job on the teacher training now, this is strictly the teacher training staff in ag education. His job primarily was research. And uh, he did his PhD here at Purdue back in the days when, uh, uh, and he got his PhD. I shouldn't say this out loud, but he got his PhD back in the days when PhDs were a dime a dozen and he couldn't get a job. So he went ahead and uh, and uh, got his PI, uh, got his master's, and then he went ahead and got a PhD, and that would put him on the staff there. Jim Trous was one of the teacher trainers here. Jim was opposed, even though he'd been one of our good teachers, he was opposed to uh, working. And then we brought in a fellow by the name of Phil Teske, and I can't remember where he came from. He was a real good operator, but he was opposed to the joint. So we had a whole staff of local people here that were opposed to uh, and training our teachers. And so, and then some of the teachers, of course, we always had a few teachers that, that uh, wanted to take advantage of the situation. They didn't want to have anything to do with 4-H in the first place. And so they, they were the ringleaders that got this started going. Then another problem that we had, and this I shouldn't say out loud, but I will, Dean Butts was uh, the dean of the ag school, and he was never in favor of vocational education. I've heard him say so many times. And um, because he wasn't in favor of it, see, he followed Dean Reed, who was here, or maybe both did, I forget. But anyway, he was uh, at that time. And he went down to these meetings I was talking about, down in the superintendent's office when they were talking about uh, doing away with that program down there, or this program up here. Uh, the dean went down, Earl Butts went down. Of course, I have known Earl ever since I uh, came back to Purdue. I lived neighbors to him for 15 years up on uh, Sylvia Street here in West Lafayette. Our kids grew up together. He had two boys, and I had three and they played together, and so, and his wife was involved with my wife and a lot of social activities here. But Earl was never interested in vocational education. He thought everything in the, in the high schools ought to be academic. He wanted everybody to come to Purdue or to go to college, and he wasn't particularly interested in people who uh, stayed on the farms, even though he grew up on the farm himself. And of course, he was uh, in 4-H work, and, the old story, he got his wife through 4-H and that sort of thing. But he didn't do anything with this committee to help uh, change the pattern down there. So, as I've indicated, I think uh, this, this uh, appointment, they closed me out down there. I said I was fired twice. They closed me out down there. <clears throat> and uh, on August 31, 1966, uh, they had asked me to stay. I could have stayed, uh, but I lived here, <clears throat> and my interests were here at the university. I had my boys and everything. 
and uh, I didn't care anything about Mullen in Indianapolis, and so I turned it down, and then I uh, uh, was on the staff here, and they put me on full time here on the staff in 4-H, <laughs> and then in about, uh, let's see, 67, yeah, about a year's time, uh, they, uh, <coughs> the Earl of Estelle on uh, Dean, uh, Howard Deaslin, do any of you know Howard Deaslin, who is the, uh, was the uh, uh, dean under, <coughs> uh, in charge of the agricultural program. And Deaslin was brought in by Earl Butts. <coughs> One day, prior to this dismissal, I got a call from Howard Deaslin's office to come down, and uh, I went down. And he had with him Earl Butts in the, in the meeting. And so I sat down and the boys, uh, <laughs> uh, they were going to figure out why it took uh, two of them to do it. But uh, Deason said that they had uh, gotten somebody else to take care of the 4-H program here in the state of Indiana. I had no idea, of course. And, and uh, so I raised the question uh, what the problem was. I said, I'd like to know what I have done or haven't done that uh, uh, makes you dissatisfied with my work. And Earl Butts woke up and said, oh, you haven't done a thing. Said, you have done a tremendous job and you've held both of these programs together and we think uh, that uh, we know it's one of the best programs in the country. But he said, we just want to make a change. <laughs> well, the reason was obvious after it happened, of course. And they brought in a fellow by the name of Fricky. You know him? No, no insult to you. No, it's, yeah. He had a Y on his name. He was a go-getter. <clears throat> by that time, we had, uh, well, on that little sheet I passed down here, and we already have a copy of it. <clears throat> refresh myself here. We had uh, increased the number of FFA chapters uh, in a 10 year period from 123 to 359, uh, three times as many. For the same period of time, the adult farmer classes, and that was important to me, had increased from 27 to 216. And uh, young farmer classes from three, that was the adult farmer, from three to 96. For each club work, it expanded from 60,000 and 37 to 95,000 and 66. <coughs> so I couldn't see anything there that uh, any reason for change, but it was uh, an internal deal here on the campus. But they kept me on uh, on the 4 H staff. Uh, that was my second firing, you see, but they kept me on the 4-H staff for another five years, and I did uh, uh, work over the state soliciting funds for what we had started as the 4-H Foundation here and the 4-H Center that some of you are familiar with. And uh, they raised a lot of money for that. And then I retired, and uh, as soon as I could, <laughs> After that, and I pulled out. Yeah. But so this man, <coughs> well, uh, here again, I, I shouldn't say, Fricky, uh, he was only on for about five years, and then they let you about He was a house of fire. Everything uh, had to go, and it had to go now. And one of the things that I uh, hate about him being in the office, he threw away everything that was over there in the 4 H office that uh, had any meaning to anybody from a historical point of view. If I had known he was going to throw it away, I'd have taken it all home with me, but I didn't. But uh, then they replaced him, well, uh, one of the staff on the extension staff was in for a while, and then they brought in this Kramer. Uh, what's his first name? Maury. Maury. And he, I think, is a real top-notch man. He a real nice job. But that's kind of the story. Any questions? So, Harold, what have you been doing since retirement? 
Oh, I've had the time of my life. I, um, <clears throat> which I've, I've traveled a lot. I've been involved uh, uh, in past district governor of Rotary and, and that sort of thing. And I've tried to go to the Rotary conventions that are scattered all over the world. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Taylor and I had the three boys. <clears throat> uh, I don't think you want to hear my history, but I'll give it to you anyway. Uh, <clears throat> all three boys graduated here at Purdue. My oldest boy that I mentioned before is uh, out in California now in marketing. Uh, my middle boy, Walter, uh, graduated here. Went down to IU and uh, spent, uh, got, uh, got his PhD in medicine. Uh, it took an extra year because they said that uh, doctors uh, needed to, to have uh, a little philosophy on how to uh, show their manners when they had a patient. And he, uh, all three of my boys were mountain climbers. They, they had skiers they liked to get up. And they, they used to ski around here. They started up here and then they went to Michigan. And, once they got out to Aspen, Colorado, they always went there after that. And <clears throat> the year that he was a senior medical student at IU and had been selected as one of uh, 50, no, one of 10 members of the graduating class to stay on at IU, he was one that had been selected. He didn't know that. And that summer, he went uh, with a group of 12 fellows on a mountain climbing trip to, uh, up in Alaska, Mount McKinley. And uh, so there were 12 of them scattered all over the country. They got together and they went out there. And we had gone, I was on a 4-H uh, tour, the people, people program that we had for years. I did three years of that in a row, and we were in the... Um, hotel in, uh, in, the world, in, in Europe, and I got word that the boys, the see the boys had gone to Mount McKinley, we got word that uh, the boys had been lost, and so of those 12, only five came back, and my boy is buried up on top of Mount McKinley someplace in a big storm that they had at that time, that was 1967. <clears throat> and so then I lost, uh, I had another boy that uh, got his PhD at Cornell and I lost him in later years. <laughs> so I only had one boy left and he's the uh, one that I was talking about. One of but I have a farm, my home farm, down in the south part of Montgomery County, on the way that you go, you go through the part of it when you go to Turkey Run, the little town of Browns Valley, that I've accumulated over a period of years. And that's my life. And, uh, see, I'm working here, Harry Leonard, who was a teacher trainer, and I was officed with him here on the staff all the years that I was here. Uh, and uh, until I state supervisor, and Harry Leonard is a farm manager, and uh, so I've been associated with farm managers, I belong to the Farm Managers Association all these years, and so I have this farm that I used to operate with hired help all the time, but I've turned it over now to tenants, and still I'll feed out about 400 head of cattle, and, and have a couple thousand acres of grain and that sort of thing. South part of Montgomery County. So that's been my life. My wife was a teacher. Uh, in fact, we were in grade school together. And uh, she was a teacher for years. And, and then when we moved here to Lafayette, the kids were still small. And when they got big enough, well, she started teaching here and taught here in, in the West Side School here down in Morton. Or got her master's after, well, she got her master's the year my 
oldest son graduated from Purdue, and they had their pictures taken together, and she wouldn't go through the ceremony because she didn't want to take away from her son. <laughs> Interesting. Um, Any questions? Well, we really uh, appreciate you coming in tonight. Thank you for giving us an overview of how agricultural education evolved in Indiana. Um, I know I learned a lot tonight about how things have progressed and, and kind of explained what, why we're, where we're at right now in the state. Well, I hope I haven't been too negative, and I, I'm not bitter about anything that has happened. But uh, <clears throat> it seemed a shame to me that uh, uh, we had some of the things happen that were bound to happen, I guess. <clears throat> One of the things, and I don't want to cast any reflections on anybody, but uh, <clears throat> one of the things that happened when we had so many boy departments, and, and we were short of teachers, training teachers here for a number of years, and a lot of folks came in from Kentucky, and uh, uh, some of uh, Wisconsin, and some of the other surrounding states, and none of those fellows had ever had any experience with 4-H work, you see. And so that began to make a difference in our program and the attitude of the teachers that we had here. Oh, in general, perhaps the whole thing uh, worked out for the best, I don't know. But we, of course, uh, as Z.M. Smith thought when he started this program, that this was the kind of program that all states should have, but uh, there's no other state that ever had a joint program like we had. But I had 20 years of it, and I am grateful for that. And and no regrets of any kind. Harold, as you take a look at the 4-H programs uh, in the state now, as 4-H is changing to get more into the urban setting, uh, do you ever see a shift where the, the local high school agriculture teacher uh, would work more jointly with the extension personnel and, and working more with 4-H? Do you ever see that coming back together again? <clears throat> we seem to be uh, rather competitive anymore. Well, it's always been that way, I think, but it was within the same organization, you see, at that time. We always had a lot of uh, competition between uh, our 4-H boys as such and FFA boys as such, but they always worked together. And uh, oh, I don't, uh, I don't, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> down through the years, we've had these changes that have happened, and uh, of course, I, s I still think the major uh, the reason that uh, things changed when they did with me was the dean here didn't give any support to the joint program. He, he himself wanted to, wanted to drop out of the vocational program. And, uh, uh, he, he was not in favor of it in the schools. He, he didn't uh, look on any vocational program as, any program as uh, what we should have in our high school. It should all be academic programs. So. If our program hadn't said vocational, if in our local programs we'd had agricultural education or agricultural science and business, do you think the dean would have had a more favorable look? I don't know. I, I wonder. Don't know what he would have done. I, I don't mean to reflect on Dean Bots. No. He's been a tremendous person, of course, but uh, it's, uh, it's one of the things that uh, has affected me personally. No, we, I've, I've had uh, the best life anybody can have under, under a program of this kind. I thoroughly enjoyed it for two years. <clears throat>